Hey guys and welcome to Caravan TV. My name is Conor McLeod and in this exclusive interview I get the chance to chat with the founder of the We The Undersigned campaign, Phil Monk. Phil is a former teacher who has used cannabis throughout his entire life to combat a range of challenging medical conditions. Unhappy with the UK narrative on cannabis, Phil founded We The Undersigned in an attempt at pressuring those in power to become aware of the hundreds of thousands of individuals that are victimised as a result of abhorrent cannabis legislation in the UK. So. Make sure you like and subscribe, and stick around until the end to make sure you don't miss out on the end of episode cartoon. Now then, let's talk cannabis. Well, thank you very much for chatting with me, Phil. This is great. Yeah, thanks for giving us the opportunity just to to talk, really, get on my soapbox, as it were. <laughs> so, could you just give us a brief background of uh, of your history as a, as an individual? Uh, in a nutshell, crikey, I'll try and wrap this up in a nutshell. Uh, I've used cannabis since I was sixteen. Uh, I used it secretly my entire life. Um, I actually, um, through ill health, um, had to stop work and had the opportunity to become um, a student through the disabled access schemes at the time that existed. Um, so through my disability conditions, I trained and became a teacher. Um, so I then became a teacher of adult literacy, numeracy and Spanish and teaching English to speakers of other languages. So. Uh, during the course of that journey, um, I went from being, I suppose, all I had was basic GCSE education to getting myself a degree in a PGCE and half of a master's. Um, and the only way I managed to achieve that was through cannabis because of the way I managed my pain. I didn't even realize then that I used cannabis for pain as it happened. Um, so I'd managed to become a teacher. Still no one knew about my cannabis. And um, I fell ill and well more ill and i had some prescribed drugs from the doctors that basically nearly killed me what was the medical uh, condition you had uh well at this point i hadn't been diagnosed at that point well I, I'd ha i've had what they call bilateral ulnar impaction syndrome um i'd had that for all my life since teenager but it took them over 10 years to find that title for the condition um so in the end i had to have my arms shortened because my ulna had grown four millimeters too long, for my radius bone, probably because of mountain biking as a kid without suspension. And um, that was one of the conditions. Uh, arthritis from running up and down mountains and growing up in the wet and cold in Wales a lot of my childhood. And, uh, and then through another injury, uh, my underlying condition of chronic myofascial pain from the joint hypermobility spectrum disorder sometimes known as JHS, Joint Hypermobility Syndrome, and it's, it's sort of like EDS, Erlos-Danlos Syndrome, which is basically a connective tissue disease. Um, my collagen, um, collagen is the elastic tissue that holds your body together. All of your body's got collagen. Um, it turns out that on a genetic level, my collagen is faulty. So rather than being, think of collagen as like an elastic band, you know, a lovely fresh elastic band, yeah. And then, you know, a, per a perished, broken one with frayed bits that snaps when you pull it. Um, my collagen is like the broken elastic band instead of like a fresh elastic band. Uh, and uh, because I was young and very muscular because of my activities, my muscles actually hid the condition. But then when I had a few injuries that basically put me on my back and stopped me from being active for, well, six to 12 months and I lost all of my muscle mass, then it became my tendons and ligaments that were holding me together and controlling my body and my joints, um, which that's not what they're designed for as such. Your muscles are supposed to do that. Um, so that is what causes significant pain throughout my body. So it took uh, about five or six years to get the diagnosis of the chronic myofascial pain from joint hypermobility spectrum disorder. Um, yeah. And in that time, um, when I first injured myself and went to the doctor, you know, I put it down to social conditioning, actually. I think back to heartbeat. I grew up on heartbeat when I was a kid, right? My mum and dad's little stepdad used to watch heartbeat in the background in the lounge. And it was, you know, a 1980s rural show of um, the doctor in the little village type thing. Yeah. And I grew up in the little Welsh village. It was very similar to where I grew up. So, you know, you fall early, you go to the doctor. You go to the doctor, the doctor gives you something and you get better. That's the equation. Yeah. I'm sure you know it yourself. Yeah. So I went to the doctor. Um, I was left on waiting lists for over a year, waiting just to be seen to check out my injured hip and various other bits. Stuck in waiting lists for years, basically. And 
without treatment in that time, and it basically left me in a chronic state, pain can state. So the injuries may well have recovered, but I'm left in the pain. Um, and also every injury I've ever had in my life still hurts me sort of thing. So mm. it's a really strange condition. And the doctor prescribed the usual thing, paracetamol, ibuprofen, then cocodamol, and they all made me ill, made my stomach ill, gave me really bad side effects. Uh, and then it went on to, um, I had beta blockers, which gave me a brain hemorrhage scare. I had citalopram antidepressants, which gave me a mini stroke scare. And then I had Zomorph, uh, was it Zomorph? It might not have been, that was the fourth one actually. There was a different morphine one in between, Tramadol. I had Tramadol and that gave me a bowel and bladder cancer scare. And then I had, that was all in very close succession, We're talking like in a matter of weeks or months, all of those basically life scared. And um, I came home after the third one and my, my children, I had my children then, this is 2014, I think. Um, and my, I remember my daughter saying to me, are you going to die, daddy? Um, when I'm in the hospital and I remember saying to her, I don't know, I can't tell a lie. Yeah. So I couldn't tell her, no, I'm going to be fine, darling, because I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. You know, the doctors are talking to cancer and all sorts. And uh, so I said the truth, because that's my nature. And I said, I'm sorry, darling, I don't know if I'm going to die or not. I hope not. Um, so, you know, me and my children and my wife all went through the, the trauma of maybe dying. Um, just to be told after lengthy investigations, oh, sorry, you're not dying and you haven't got cancer or brain tumor. You haven't had a stroke. It's the side effects of your medicine. Yeah. And I was like, what? You mean to tell me you're giving me those to make me feel better and they've done this to me? I'm not taking them again. Oh, you can't do that, Mr. Monk, because if you stop taking them, it might kill you. Mm. So you have to keep taking the things that have nearly killed you and come off them slowly so they don't kill you. And I was like, you call that medicine? I says, no, I'm not having nothing off you anymore, right? I went home and I sat down and had a conversation with my children. I said to my children in the living room, still very poorly, children, I've been taking the doctor's drugs uh, and they've nearly killed me three times at this point. Uh, and as it happened, I've been using something my entire life secretly and it makes my life better. It takes my pain to bearability, uh, but the government tell everyone it's bad for me and I'm a criminal and I shouldn't have it. And my daughter looked at me and said, well, you've got a right to the government daddy and tell them that you're wrong. They're wrong. Yeah. Um, and that's literally what I did at 2014. I uh, wrote to the government and told them they've got it all wrong about cannabis. Um, like I said, I was a teacher. So I used, I did dissertations. I've written 10,000 essays, word essays, you know, uh, I know how to do academic research on the internet. Mm -hmm. So, my, my surgeon had told me he wanted to shorten my bones. Now, at this point in my life, I smoked cannabis with tobacco. Um, my wife, I had just nursed through two slip discs and bone fusion operations. And so I knew from her experience that tobacco was a bone toxin. Um, and you couldn't, if you had tobacco, it would affect the healing of your bones. In fact, I found out that tobacco nicotine is highly poisonous. I didn't actually know that before then. And um, uh, I also, you know, I nursed my wife through gabapentin and pregabalin, which were two very, very strong drugs. Uh, I mention that now because when I had my third death scare, that's what they wanted to put me on next. Okay, Mr. Monk, we'll take you off the tramadol and we'll put you on the pregabalin. And I'm like, fuck off. Sorry. <laughs> You're not putting me on anything. I will no longer be a guinea pig for you and your pharmaceutical industry. I will grow my own cannabis and I will provide it for myself. And I will look after my own health from now on because you've done nothing but nearly kill me. And that's licensed and approved of drugs. So um, on that basis in 2014, um, the quality of the cannabis on the street was diabolical. Um, I lived in Shropshire at the time. You could only get wet cannabis flowers resin had all just disappeared and it was just this really rubbish wet flowers that I think no one knew what they were doing basically quite new um, the scene had changed from resin to what people like to call skunk that is basically just cannabis flowers and um, it was rubbish basically 
Um, and I knew I would be better off to look for a variety of cannabis with the right ratio to THC and CBD for my condition um, and then to grow it at home organically. Uh, and then I knew I wasn't funding the unlicensed um, criminal market. I knew that I wasn't having anything of, of poor quality. So I knew I wasn't having any contaminated flowers that would further harm my health. Uh, so basically, it was the only moral, safe and ethical way to provide myself with my cannabis. I went to my GP with uh, a printout from the Dutch Cannabis Bureau for Bedrican, which was uh, actually Jack Herer strain. So it's the variety of cannabis Jack Herer they used to make Bedrican at the time in Holland, which is a 22% THC cannabis flower. And I went into my, my GP and he'd known me for quite some years and um, he was very supportive as it happens. I was very blessed. And I said, can you prescribe this for me, please? Because under the specials licensing by law, you can prescribe whatever is in the best interest of your patient. And this Dutch government grow this cannabis in a medical environment and they sell it around the world to pharmacies. Could you please prescribe that to me? And he, my doctor looked at me and this is verbatim. He said, Phil, I would love to prescribe that for you. But if I do that, the GMC will squash me. So the GMC is the general medical council. Yeah. So he was basically, he, he, he wanted, he knew it helps and wanted to help me, but he couldn't because the system would destroy his life if he did. Now he had a wife, he had a children, he had a mortgage. Hippocratic oath, I should have come before all that, but he's a human. And so he had to put that before me. So he had to say, I'm sorry, Phil, I can't prescribe for you. He wrote me a very supporting letter. Um, now the day I planted my first cannabis seed, I wrote to the prime minister, the deputy prime minister, the justice minister, the health minister, and my local MP. And I told them my medical conditions, my near death experiences, I listed my human rights. And then I re listed research about cannabis because when they told me, when my doctor said, they're going to chop your arms up, shorten them, I knew tobacco was a bone toxin. Oh God, what, what about my cannabis? You know, I didn't know anything, right? This is 2014. I've been toking all my life, a secret toker. When I used to go fly fishing, if I was in too much pain, you know, I couldn't hold my rod anymore because of my wrist, literally. I'd have a really good, strong joint. And I'd do another hour's fishing. And then I'd either, you know, my hands would pack up again. So I'm like, ooh, can't do anything. And then it's like, oh, should I just go home? I oh, know, I'll have another joint. And I'd do another hour's fishing. So I'd have another joint and do another hour's fishing. I'd take a bong and have a bong, or I'd take cookies or cakes or biscuits or sweets, whatever, all infused with cannabis. And I actually realized for the first time ever, you know, I'm using this to manage my pain. And I just hadn't realized. I thought I was just a naughty stoner. I really thought I was just a naughty stoner, secret toker. Yeah, I'm a teacher, and I was a good teacher because I wasn't a drinker, and I was a toker, so I reflected more than what drinkers do. And um, it helped me as a teacher, I do believe, as well as being a parent. But I thought, what does cannabis do to my body? So I Googled. <coughs> my first ever Google search, you know, what does cannabis do to the human body? I didn't know about THC and CBD at this point. The cannabis, I just wanted to find out what it would do to my body. And one of the first pieces of research I found, which really blew my mind, because obviously I'm, I'm having my bones chopped in half and plated back together. So it's bone healing is my main concern now yeah so i google what's the effect of cannabis on the human body and i find out <laughs> cannabis regulates and maintains homeostasis in the human body now i remember back to gcse uh, biology homeostasis is balance mm. at a cellular level when you're in homeostasis that means you're in a state of health your body's perfectly balanced if you're out of homeostasis you're in a sense of ill health for whatever reason, and, and it manifests in whatever way according to whatever the um, imbalance is. So I, I found these research papers that talked about how cannabis um, regulates and maintains the, the homeostasis through the endocannabinoid system. But I started looking more and I found out that, you know, I, I learned all about biology as a kid. I, I trained in anatomy and physiology at college. No one had ever told me about an endocannabinoid system. I learned all the body systems. And what's this? There's a system no one's ever told me about. 
So I start looking into it a bit more, the endocannabinoid system. Endo meaning within. So you have endogenous, which means within the body, and exogenous, which means without of the body, or outside of the body. So, you know, I start reading and start looking at all these different researchers, and I find a piece of paper by Edinburgh University, by the same university, that cannabis prevents osteoporosis in old people because it regulates bone growth density and development. And I found paper after paper after paper of all these amazing benefits of cannabis. Um, so I wrote to the government and I shared it to them. <laughs> I found this is the one that really, this is the one that set me on fire, right? I do feel of myself a bit of a man on fire. I've been burning incandescent rage since 2014 without any, any sense, any caution to the consequence to me or my family um, because I've been screaming the truth from the rooftops anywhere I can and the government lie through their teeth on this matter. So I found a paper by Philip Robson. It was actually published in 2001. It was actually commissioned in, two in 1996 by the health department uh, and they asked Philip Robson if he would research the therapeutic aspects of cannabis and cannabinoids. Interestingly, it was uh, printed in the substance misuse papers, interestingly enough. So once again, I think they're trying to prove how harmful cannabis is. Yeah. And unfortunately for them, in 1998, Philip Robson reports back to the government, cannabis is remarkably therapeutic and reasonably safe as well. We need time to develop marketable cannabis-based products, and the government should cease prosecuting or criminalizing people who assuage their symptoms with natural herbal cannabis. So they were the, in short, the three recommendations of the Philip Robson paper. They actually showed, you know, it helped with pain, insomnia, anxiety, depression, loss of appetite, so much more. Um, so what the government did with that report, they put it on a shelf in the Library of Science and Drug Addiction. Is the utmost hypocrisy. I mean, this is this is a totally this is the same foul. This is really frustrating, and anybody that's unaware of cannabis will be shocked to say the least at this kind of stuff. Um, but this is this is what we've been dealing with for a while. It's only been recently in the past few years that these things have been coming to light. So I, mean, I take it this it consequently led to you forming the uh, We the Undersigned. Uh, no, not initially. In 2014, uh, I actually I'm going to start a campaign, and then I actually found out. Crikey, it's been going on for 40 years. Yeah. I didn't know because the media hides it so well. I know that now because I've tried to get in the media. The media hide it well. The media stop the general public really knowing that there's much of a campaign and a fight by the people who choose cannabis for their freedom and equality in society. It's always about legalizing cannabis, but cannabis cannot be legalized. Mm -hmm. um, the law does not control inanimate, inanimate objects. The law controls and punishes people so we cannot legalize cannabis we can only make it no longer a criminal offense to possess it or to cultivate it or to share it when i give you a joint yeah. or to sell it distribute it you know so it's it's um so when did you initially form the we the undersigned was this recently is this the past because essentially your facebook page i think i looked on is two years old is that right yeah that's right i spent four years uh supporting other people's campaigns um at the time, it was the United Patients Alliance um, and CLIA and um, the UK CSC as well. And then in 2018, uh, we had the build up to the law change. Um, the United Patients Alliance at the time um, went from, I very much believe in um, the right for self sufficiency. Yeah. Uh, I should be able to seek herbal independence. I shouldn't have to be beholden to a company and have to pay a company for what I can produce in my own back garden. Um, I can home brew my own booze and home grow my own bed. Why not the most nutritious herb on the planet? Yeah. But the, the United Patients Alliance, to, to me, not just my opinion, many other people's opinion, they suddenly became very narrowed on the pharmaceutical route. Cannabis must come from a pharmacy. It must be prescribed by a specialist doctor. And all these sudden controls and rules that had never been in their campaign for the four years previously. It had all been about getting facts out, getting knowledge out, getting access for people and for change in the law. And then suddenly it became about getting access to prescribed cannabis based medical products uh, and things like that. And it just took a very different direction, which for me personally, I was hurt by um, because I'd been a very powerful supporter for the last previous four years. Um, 
And they basically kicked me out of their groups um, because I was asking a few pertinent questions. You know, what are cannabis therapeutics? Will herbal cannabis still be permitted? And will you allow the right to grow or will you support the right to grow your own? With that, I had a nasty word in my ear from one of their directors and then I was kicked out of the group with no shorter to do. And I've always believed it's a human rights issue. 2014, to me, it's a human rights issue then. And the reason that CLEAR kind of fell out with me, I was they CLEAR, I was a um, big supporter of CLEAR. I was supposed to go meet the then um, Justice Minister Lynn Featherstone with um, Peter Reynolds. So I was meant to go as a delegation for CLEAR. And Peter Reynolds basically said to me, you're not allowed to talk about human rights in the meeting. And I said, excuse me. I said, you're telling me you're going to take me in this meeting and then you're going to tell me what I can and can't say in this meeting. Yeah. And he said, look, it's not a human rights issue. It's been established in human rights law in the UK that it's not a human rights issue. And it is actually factually correct in what he states there because he's making reference to the Quail case, which moved the right to medical necessity. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 there has been many attempts on a human rights base in the UK that have failed. So he wasn't wrong in what he was saying. At the same time, you don't take someone to a meeting and tell them what they can and can't say. Mm -hmm. So I did say to him, I'm going to respectfully decline your invitation and I'll get there under my own steam and I'll have my own meetings with people and I'll say whatever I need to say. I will not have anyone dictate to me what I can and can't say in a meeting. Uh, and this is entirely a human rights issue. I'm a human and you're denying me the right to my private life, the freedom of consciousness and my autonomy of health. Yeah. And you're dictating, not you, but the system, that I must take toxic pharmaceutical drugs that are killing me. How is it not a human rights issue? And basically, we fell out and I left clear. Um, and I put a, um, a post before I left these groups. I put a post in and I had a rant, basically, because we had Billy Caldwell, Murray Gray, and Alfie Dingley in the news. And I'd just been to Parliament uh, with the UPA, February the 23rd, um, and I think that might have been 2018, and it was protesting for cannabis on prescription. And um, I was really angry because the children were dying. The children are suffering. Not I'm an adult, okay? I'm suffering, but it hurts more when the children are suffering. Yeah. Um, I like um, justice more when you've got these little innocent people that don't even know the systematic framework and they're going through yeah. this trauma as a consequence, you know. But the trauma that you mentioned, the trauma they're getting from the, the side effects of their drugs, okay, who uh, the, the trauma from the side effects of the drugs that they're pumping them for is terrible. I knew that myself from my own experience. And like I say, a man on fire, righteous anger, and, ah, you know, I'm, I'm screaming fury at the injustice and the suffering that they're causing. So I just wrote a post saying, I believe this is a human rights issue. I intend to write to every human rights solicitor in the country to ask if any of them will take my case, because I was thinking of me initially. Mm -hmm. um, and then I realized it's more than me. And it's not just medical and recreational. Uh, anyone choosing cannabis shouldn't be victim of prosecution, no matter why they choose it. Yeah. maintains homeostasis yeah. you know so with that fury um i wrote this message out inviting people to undersign to my letter so would anyone like to undersign to my letters to these human rights solicitors and make it our case not a phil monk case but we yeah. case we the undersigned on this letter case and that was where the the name for the group came from Good, that's um, good. That's good. That's very well, organic. Excuse the pun, but that's an organic process, really. Oh, organic's the thing because I had no intention of making a campaign. I had no intention of anything, right? I was just furious and I did a little post out and ranted it into these groups Medical Marijuana, UK, UKC, UPA, Clear, all of them because they hadn't quite fallen out with me and kicked me out adequately at that point. So I took this message in saying, I believe it's this. I want to write to them. Anyone who wouldn't sign to my letter, comment below I took my daughters to their taekwondo lesson i came back an hour and a half two hours later turned my phone on and it, it, it just melted <laughs> notifications um now as i said i've had my arms shortened right yeah. and that was four years of 
eight, four operations over four years. So I haven't, I still can't use my laptop. Um, I still can't do a lot of things, in fact, we're told. Um, and I had to get my laptop out, blow the dust off, and get my laptop out and make a group. Now, I didn't know how to make a Facebook group. I've only been on Facebook so I could start moaning about bloody cannabis. Facebook's my soapbox, you know? Yeah. So um, I was inundated with responses to this uh, invitation to undersign. And uh, you mentioned the word organically. It grew organically and exponentially for the first year at a phenomenal pace. Uh, I spent the first year, well, first of all, as a community, we wrote the letter to the solicitors because some people were like, yeah, I like this idea and I agree with you, but I'm not undersigning to anyone's letter till I've seen what's written on it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's fair enough. That mm -hmm. makes a lot of, you know, then it became this very organic community letter. In fact, if you were to go into the Facebook group and scroll all the way back to the beginnings, you will find draft after draft after draft of the solicitor's letter while we as a community uh, wrangled and discussed what the content was going to be. Um, so then we finished the content and I spent a year literally, you know, every day of the week, emailing, phoning, messaging on people's um, websites, um, doing my best to find a solicitor that would take our case. Now, they all said, well, yeah, we'll take your case, Mr. Monk, if you go for a narrow medical focus, medical cannabis. Why well, yeah. just focus on the medicinal value? Well, they, they felt that uh, with emotive cases such as mine and children's, they felt it was a sure win in a court to be able to change the law about cannabis for medical purposes. But that's not enough for me. Yeah. Because I know the truth. Mm -hmm. And then a member shared into the group late 2018 or before, no, it was April 2018, you know, it was an article about a new cannabis law firm. Um, and it was an article about a solicitor called Robert Jaffe, who was specializing in cannabis law. And one of my members in the group just said, have you written to this chap yet? And I was like, no, I haven't. I'm doing it now. Yeah. And I literally went from that. I got my, my letter that we've all developed. And I banged it over to him in an email. It's been Friday night, I think. He phones me 10 o'clock Sunday night. Um, and, you know, that impressed me. As a, he was an off-the-clock kind of person. Um, and we had a really good lengthy chat. And he sort of said the same thing. Very political. Uh, mm. It's going to cost a lot. Take a long time. But it's not impossible. Mm. And I'm willing to have a go. Yeah. And that was the difference, you see. All the others weren't willing to try. Mm. Whereas he was quite willing to try and support the WTU to challenge the injustice of the status quo. Um, so on April... Which is quite interesting, Phil, really, because a lot of the things, when you're saying that the other solicitors in particular were negligent to, to participate, the thing that popped to my mind is it's a personal circumstance. Most of these people don't want to attach their professional um, career to something that they think will tarnish it. And that's, that's where we're dealing with this. It's not only cannabis, you're dealing with these personal subjective uh, uh, positions that undermine what the, the whole movement is. It undermines truth, justice, and freedom. Exactly. It undermines human rights completely. Exactly. Uh, and you are, you are, like my GP, it's self-preservation. Um, the actual fact of the matter is, you are right, it, it could potentially tarnish and destroy a career, or it could potentially make it. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. The, 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 the person who breaks down this law and chains it so it stops the injustice and stops the harm that it's causing, it's forever they'll forever. be a hero for decade but that has been the very real risk um, so on april april 20th at 4 20 in 2019 i think it was because it took a year we launched the wtu crowd justice fundraiser um no more government war against the canna community was the title i gave it i'm not very short on words i'm sorry um because <laughs> You know, that, that month, Theresa May had been in Parliament saying, the war on cannabis must continue. It's not a war on cannabis. Mm. It's, it's a war, war on, on me. It's a war on you. Yeah. It's a war on people and our, our preferred way of life, mm. mainly because we choose cannabis often instead of booze or pharmaceutical drugs, yeah. both of which industries heavily lobby government.
Yeah, one of the things as well when it comes to language, when it comes to that, it's like I don't really like using the term. I wrote it in the book as well. I prefer using the term cannabis consumer, as I'm sure you do, because cannabis yeah. user implies uh, that's that's the, the the drug narratives, but they would never yes. call it an alcohol user. It's a alcohol consumer, right. and it's these kind of. Uh, techniques that have been used continuously year after year after year so it's like breaking down these barriers is a, is a big deal as well so uh, to fast forward to your open letter that you put across uh, this yeah. year, um essentially I've, i'll just read off a couple of these because i've got it here at the side it's an extremely articulate letter i must say phil and uh, and it actually hits on every single point which is uh, relevant so you sent this out to uh, <laughs> you sent this out to the director for public prosecution oh. Um, I've got to intervene. I'm going to make it a we, if I may, because again, that was an organic community letter. It's not a film and letter. It's not me. That no, is no. we, the undersigned. That was wrangled out over several weeks or months in the community in our Facebook group until we finally got to that version there. That's a good man. So, point that out. Good man. Good. Good for you, Phil, for not taking the credit for this. Because I'm sure a uh, group of people behind. I'm, I'm a catalyst. Oh. A catalyst. That's all. No, that's fine. Well, uh, so you sent this out to the to the Director for Public Prosecutions, the Policing Minister and the Home Secretary. And a few of the points that I thought were, and this is just for anybody that's unaware, you can find this on Phil's website, um, on, on the Weird Underside website, I'm, sure, I'm sorry, um, is that uh, essentially this is relating to Leslie and Mark Gibson's uh, case where they were uh, uh, cultivating cannabis for medicinal value and uh, the, the Crown Prosecution Service ended up finding that there was not within the public interest to prosecute, therefore, which led the way for we the undersigned to then articulate in the light of this case, um, when is it relevant um, for individuals to be uh, prosecuted at any point in time? Will the Crown Prosecution Service clarify when it's in the public, uh, public interest? And a few of the other points as well that um, are extremely relevant is like, um, in the view of the evidence, does the government agree that these harms, um, which are caused through policing and, and other instances like that, could be reduced by mitigating decriminalisation, regulation and taxation? How does the government justify allowing large multinational corporations to profit from cannabis whilst prosecuting individuals such as the Gibsons for seeking sustainable use, um, which is avoiding black market use? So these, these points, are, these are key uh, points that were sent out in January. Did you get a reply? And, um, and essentially, what, what, what position do you get at the moment? Uh... No, in a nutshell, um, coronavirus happened. Yeah. So we sent them out. Um, we didn't get any. I actually sent it as well to um, loads of MPs, police, crime commissioners, chief constables, uh, everyone I could find, just to basically try and sow seeds of doubt in people's minds to try and make the change on the ground level. Yeah. Because if you deliver the facts to people and let them become fully informed, and their thoughts will change. And when their thoughts change, their actions change, their beliefs change. And the way they uh, enforce this uh, fraudulent law may change. So it was a, a huge splash of a letter out to loads and loads of people. Uh, we had lots of replies from these other people, but I didn't ever receive a truly meaningful reply from the CPS or the Department of Justice or any of them, actually. Um, but we very quickly came into crisis, I think, soon after. I don't actually think, when did I post it on that? It was, uh, I think it was January 6th, 2000, this year, January 6th, I think, if I was just have a quick look. No, we should have, because uh, the lockdown didn't happen until March, wasn't it? March. Uh, February the 4th, it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, when the was the lockdown? It was, the lockdown was uh, March 13th, so that's what made me think, because you'd actually put a, um, a proposal of a, I expect a reply, we expect a reply within 14 days. That was right. I have absolutely no... One of the things as well I quite uh, enjoyed as well is that you said, if I was to just uh, put this back up again, um, are you in agreement? It says, um, wait, if I was to just find this. Um, will you all work, the, the people that you got in contact with, the, the Home Secretary and the Policing Minister, um, will you work collectively in your, in your particular professions to remove the ideological inaccuracies that cannabis um, use has had to endure for these decades and decades, which is extremely pertinent because a lot of people, as you're aware, as we've just mentioned, solicitors might not interact because they are personally at risk, or then you'll have doctors who might not interact because they will be liable for medicines, and then you'll have judges that will not interact because then they'll be accountable for letting people off. You've got this extremely complex structure of people who, every step of the way, cause prohibition to even be in place. So to hit the nail on the head with that is quite good. Unfortunately, it's sadly humorous that you never even have a reply. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't. My intention had been to um, put the replies on the website. Right. Um, and I did have some replies. I think I then had to prepare for a campaign at the CBD Hemp Expo at the NEC. Right. So I was invited to talk there, 
which uh, really takes it out of me to say the least. Mm. So I, I, I believe after posting, preparing for the campaign, recovery from campaign, then lockdown kicks in. Um, I intend to chase these up actually. Uh, and I think what I will do is ask for the, the solicitor representing us for the solicitor to send them and ask them for a more concrete response. Uh, because as yet we haven't had one that really we could say any response. I have just written another, another letter because so far all of the responses have been from a different prime minister. Boris Johnson himself hasn't ruled on this matter. So uh, we've just penned another letter um, to Boris Johnson and I think it's Priti Patel who's the Home Secretary at the moment, yeah, right. to both of those, um, asking them some questions about their current position and their intended position. Um, because you know, there's no need to take the government to court if they plan on changing the law anyway, um, yeah. in some ways. Um, failing that, um, we're just applying more pressure as well. Uh, a lot of people say, it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of pounds, you can never afford to do this case. Mm. Well, there's five million people in the UK estimated to choose cannabis for whatever purpose. Yeah. Well, if we could get even a percentage of those five million, we've got 1% in WTU at the minute, we have 5,740 members, I think. You know, we've got 1% of the canna community in WTU at the minute. Now, if we could get that, if I could make a nationwide campaign so they knew we were fighting for their rights, and they all came and joined and put just a pound in the pot, we would have the money to take this litigation through the courts, no problem whatsoever. The main problem we have at the minute, it's a group of 5,000 odd, mainly sick and disabled people fighting for the rights of healthy people as well. Mm -hmm. And that's the significant difference of WTU. There's no such thing as medical cannabis or recreational cannabis. I was actually going to say that just before we actually touch on that there, Phil, there is a slight hope that I've had and I'll be through a few people I've interviewed, they've kind of, some of them have been in favour of this opinion, some have disregarded it wholeheartedly, but the fact is that Boris Johnson has at least two members on his um, political staff at this moment in time who have actively researched cannabis. Um, I think one of them yeah. for Vote Face went over to Canada and analysed it and had yeah. positive responses because it's essentially impossible to not, if you had an open mind and you have an objective approach, it's impossible to not acknowledge the benefits of this plant. So I do have the same hope as yourself that hopefully we might not even get to this. Hopefully they'll, the same with the boost to the economy. Um, again, uh, yeah. I can't remember who it was that I interviewed, but they had, uh, I think it might have been Jeff Ditchfield actually, who disregarded the idea of a boost to the economy through cannabis being decriminalised because of the fact that um, they won't allow it. He says, in the next five years, if you're lucky, but I doubt that they'll care about this kind of thing. And the reality is, I feel that Personally, this is one of their most um, favoured opinions. Are we going to financially benefit? If that's the case, let's move it forward. Well, this is my, I mean, I, I was about to be shocked at Jeff's opinion then, but it's not as is, is, is cynical, but justifiably cynical yeah, yeah. from experience. Yeah. So he's actually saying, not that it hasn't got the potential to save our economy and save our environment because of its environmental benefits. We haven't even touched on those. We've only talked about health. Yeah. We haven't talked about the environment. It's crimes against the environment not to end prohibition. Yeah. Um, but Jeff is quite accurate in what he's saying. Because, unfortunately, all of Westminster, well, they've all got pensions. And those pensions are all invested in alcohol, tobacco, pharmaceutical, arms deals. Yeah. All these dodgy industries, many of which pay the government not to change the law. They pay the government to keep cannabis prohibited because... Cannabis itself is such a threat to all of those industries. Yeah. Um, so that's why they won't let it happen. It's not that it hasn't got the potential, but they they want to protect, they want to get their investments in order. Yeah, they want to make sure they can de de is it divest from that and invest in that. And that's what we're seeing is in the process now. Yeah, yeah. Well, just before we spoke about that, you were mentioning the false dichotomy between recreational and medicinal, which is quite, uh, which is quite accurate because there is a false dichotomy when you're talking about cannabis in particular. With even with the layman, they tend to focus on one or the other, and these yes. things are interchangeable. You know, recreational cannabis is the medicinal. You have, as you've mentioned already in this conversation, you were using recreationally, if you want to use that term, which was having a medicinal impact as well. And you have people that will use medicinally that will have a recreational response if, for that term. So it would be handy to remove the basis of these two things however the practical application of removing them i seem i don't see it being, well you, know. you mentioned previously how they use words semantic yeah. trickery words influence thoughts and thoughts influence actions people call them spells because of spelling yeah. like magic spells 
Yeah. And in a sense, it is a bit like saying spells. And sorry, my daughter's distracting me. Um, <laughs> they, they, they choose their words extremely carefully um, to create thoughts and beliefs in people's minds. And they also spread the news carefully. So they'll talk about recreational cannabis as though it's different to medical cannabis. And now, in actual fact, in a sense, there are two things. You, you have cannabis cultivated in a pharmaceutical setting that is sterilized, homogenized, and standardized that is now available on prescription, um, which I suppose you could now call that medical cannabis because it's been standardized, whereas what you get from the street, you've no idea where it's grown. It isn't standardized. No one knows anything. So in that sense, there is a slight difference. But my, my point is, is an individual can yeah. take a seed, let's call it skunk number one, which is what they use to make Sativex mm -hmm. for muscular uh, MS, or you could use Jack Hera, which is what they use for Bedrocan. Um, you could cultivate those seeds and you could cultivate cannabis and that cannabis could be therapeutic for you. Mm -hmm. um, so really, it's, it's, they use the words the wrong way around. It's the use of cannabis for medical purposes or the use of cannabis for spiritual purposes, creative purposes, recreational purposes. And, and this recreation is just so narrow, like, like it's immoral to enjoy yourself. Yeah. The recreational use of alcohol is okay. It actually touches perfectly on the uh, a little bit of sly marketing with the vape there, Phil. I like it. <laughs> What's that vape you're using anyway? What is that? Um, I, was, I was gifted this by a very good friend. It's a mighty. Yeah, that looks good, man. Um, and I have to say, of all the vapes I've used, I do recommend the Mighty. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've got tobacco out of my life now, so I just smoke blunts normally. Yeah. Uh, I do vape as well. Uh, I don't find it gives me quite the same amount of relief as I need. But uh, when I went to Amsterdam for a bit, and it was, uh, it was three days, and I got I tried the Volcano, and it was a cannabis college, and uh, I found it to be absent. I found that there, there was a sensation that was absent, and I don't know if it's the, the, the decarboxylation process doesn't quite fulfill it, which it does, because you're activating the THC, AT, THC, all that kind of stuff, but I don't know. I just feel having a pipe or having a joint uh, hits the mark, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, exactly it is for me as well. Yeah. Um, I think whether it's because I'm an old-school combustion head, it, yeah. I really don't know. You know, I grew up on hot <laughs> knives and buckets. Sorry, if I would just uh, go back to that when you're talking about the, the, the false dichotomy between recreational and medicinal use uh, and how it's stigmatized recreationally in particular. That to be recreationally using cannabis is uh, somewhat negative in comparison to using it medicinal, and that's completely false. And one of the things that's quite um, that, that's connected to that wholeheartedly is THC. THC is, is a derogatory molecule that's given through the media. That's what they, they refer to as this derogatory molecule. CBD is demonized cannabinoid. Demonized cannabinoid. That's exactly the best way to describe it. And you've got CBD, which is this holistic um, hero, essentially, whereas yeah. THC is this last demon that we just need to get rid of, essentially, through the BBC and through these media strains. So could you just touch on how THC is equally, if not more, therapeutic than CBD? Well, yes, absolutely. Uh, in the first instance, for me personally, and... Um, this may go down like a lead balloon. I believe the THC is essential, aside from um, initiating the entourage effect, which is whereby um, THC enables all of the other cannabinoids, because there's far more than just the two, there's over 140 odd, I believe, even more, probably still finding them. Yeah. Uh, the THC um, enables them to work together more powerfully. Um, someone made an analogy for me, Imagine um, all of the cannabinoids are workers in a factory, okay? And they're all at the bus stop, or they're all waiting to go to work, and they've got to go and work in the factory, which is the human body, okay? And THC, or anandamide, as it is when we produce it in our own body, yeah. um, THC is the vehicle that can carry all of the cannabinoids to help them work more efficiently and synergistically around the whole factory, and more efficiently, rather than taking the time of walking there really slowly. Yeah. Uh, and that was the, the analogy someone gave me, which I, I thought it just summed it brilliantly. You know, yeah. THC is the coach that gets all the other cannabinoids to work. Um, to me, alcohol deadens the brain. It literally kills brain cells. It's flavored poison. Yeah. Um, and even the, the World Health Organization, who I don't entirely trust as much as I used to anymore, even they have acknowledged there is no safe quantity of alcohol for the human body to ingest. Mm -hmm. um, 
a few whereas stats, sorry, a few cannabis yeah. regulates and maintains homeostasis. You know, let the two sink in. It's to me, imagine in my mind, the government, the establishment is the biggest, most corrupt drug dealer ever. And their drugs are alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, sugar, and pharmaceuticals. They're the drugs that they push because that industry pay them to push it. If you choose any other drug, you will be prosecuted. I mean, uh, take, take away the sugar element there. I actually wrote exactly that in my book, Phil, that I used the comparison of cannabis with alcohol, uh, caffeinated, beverage, caffeinated energy drinks, and tobacco and nicotine. And what was found was alcohol causes World Health Organization reference here. Um, 5% of all diseases worldwide. Um, one in five deaths um, every minute is caused by alcohol. Um, you know, it's, it's just ridiculous. That's yeah, caffeinated yeah. energy drinks in particular have um, been strongly linked to over 300 deaths since 2017 as a relate of uh, cardio, uh, uh, cardiac arrest, stuff like this. Yeah. These are things that obviously don't get really reported on because then you're going to have to go this whole new legal process and that. And yet the entire time we're dealing with this plant, as you've mentioned, which instigates a physiologically natural process, your body, and let's be honest, even the fact that it's called an endocannabinoid system is only present. And the only reason why we know about this system is because of decades of painful research, which which allowed us to shine the light on this. And the thing that people, the viewers, if they're unaware of this, they should be aware of the fact that it wasn't one dynamic of research that found this system. It was a, it was a collective body of international research from, uh, from Israel to the America to the UK mm -hmm. that found a variety of receptors. Um, the basis of the beginning was how, how does cannabis interact with the brain? Um, how does it interact with the body? And, and we thought at the beginning, at the beginning of the 90s, end of the 80s, that it was a one-way street, that we were dealing with something that just naturally stimulated it. And it wasn't until they discovered the CB1 receptor, CB2 receptors, that it started to shine a light on the fact that we have a physiological system. And one of the good things I think you've got on your website as well, amongst many things, to be honest, on, your, on We The Undersigned, is that um, the endocannabinoid system deficiency, um, and, and, and how that, um, which was coined, I think, by, um, I think it was uh, Ethan Russell, um, at the Institute yeah. of Cannabinoid Inst uh, uh, Research, and uh, which, for anybody that's unaware, um, is a collective term for a hypothesized um, reason behind variety of medical conditions, such as fibromyalgia, migraines, um, irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and this is, this is research that, again, I think it was 2002, 2003 that it came out. So we're really at the beginning of understanding what this is. Um, Mike Barnes, he had quite a, a, probably one of the best descriptions of the endocannabinoid system as being the master controller of all yeah. other physiological systems. And the fact is that if this is the master controller and we've just found out about it, what have we learned still? Well, what I concluded, um, when I say I concluded, it was from reading all these different papers, many of which you've just listed, uh, many of whom actually have supplied their, their research to the WTU for our pending case. So Mike Barnes has provided evidence, uh, Ethan Russo has provided evidence, um, Chris Bennett's also the historian providing evidence. Uh, we are working with other experts trying to gather them into the fold as well. Um, I've read you haven't mentioned Dr. William Courtney as it happened. I'm unfamiliar with him actually, I'll write him down. What is uh, that? You can look up Dr. William Courtney. Right. Um, he's in the same vein of Ethan Russo in the belief that cannabis is food. Uh, and this is what I believe, cannabis is food before anything else. Yeah. It only appears medicinal when it's reintroduced to a malfunctioning endocannabinoid system. So, you know, whatever endocannabinoid you may be deficient, it then manifests as some sort of disease or dis-ease as it is. Um, and when you have cannabis, it rebalances or brings back to homeostasis or as close to it as possible, depending on what damage has occurred to the systems, uh, and then restores back to health. Little Murray Gray is the best example of this. Yeah. You know, he hasn't got medicinal cannabis. He has got concentrated cannabis food. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, to me, what he's eating. And that cannabis food is bringing him to homeostasis and repairing the damage of his epilepsy, the neurological imbalance caused by a deficiency of endocannabinoids. I don't know which one specifically. The yeah. government and the pharmaceutical industry, I found in a paper, it's... The pharmaceutical, uh, the pharmaceutical manipulation of the endocannabinoid system for targeted therapies. So that basically they want to manipulate the endocannabinoid system, find out which uh, imbalance is caused and resolved by which cannabinoids, so that they can give you a very expensive product that's patented with just specific cannabinoids in to try and address this tiny issue. 
But cannabis doesn't work that way. It works in synergy together for the whole entourage of the whole plant. To take out two little bits and give you them bits, it, it won't work. And then because they're a pharmaceutical industry, they add loads of other crap to it to make it novel so they can patent it. And all those ingredients then cause side effects, including death. Yeah. Cannabis doesn't cause death. Yeah. No, the, 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 the Nepa dialects do. Yeah, when, when you touched on the cannabis as a food thing, I do find it quite interesting that um, beginning of the 20th century, looking at 1927, I think cannabis became illegal, uh, prohibited in the UK. So even the production of hemp was restricted wholeheartedly. Um, and, and since then, we've had this um, increasing circumstance of new medical conditions which have appeared. And as you've perfectly mentioned, I, I don't see it as an inconsistent correlation. The fact is that this is a dietary situation that we've had an absence of cannabinoid intake with a diet. And then we have uh, influx of medical conditions which require cannabinoids to be included in your diet. So I do think that I really hope that in the next few years, as research in, uh, increases and that kind of thing, and essentially as knowledge increases, that we're going to be dealing with more of a. I mean, in fact, it's already present. I think you have some stuff on your on your website relating to cannabis as foods, edibles, but not just as an intoxicant as edibles, as a legitimate cannabinoid intake. You know, um, one yeah. of the things when you were mentioning earlier um, about hemp. And the difference, and we'll touch on that in a sec, about the difference between hemp and cannabis, and is there a difference? But the, the basis of um, raw cannabis, I think, which you've mentioned on We the Understand website as well, raw cannabis has a variety of, um, of components which are nutritional that don't have, once you've heated cannabis up, so you've got the acidic forms, THCA, CBDA, CBGA, and these, these, these um, acidic forms which are going to be nutritional. Um, if I was just to rattle off a couple of things that are found in nutritional benefits of cannabis here, you've got vitamins, minerals, fatty acids, you have proteins, it's high in omega-3, it has all the amino acids, um, you know, and this is just a small amount that I've described here, um, and the, all yeah. these things are highly accountable for well, any cannabis, I, you know. You need to change your word in there, sorry, interrupt you, Connor. You mentioned amino acids twice, yeah. but the actual term is essential amino acids. Yeah. That's their title. Yeah. These are the essential amino acids, building blocks of life, that cannabis has in the right concentrations and ratios for absorption into the human body. Mm. We've co-evolved with the plant. We shouldn't be having fish oils because that isn't where we need our amigas from. We need them from cannabis. Yeah. So that's why I bang on that essential. Cannabis to me is an essential nutrient for homeostasis in a nutshell. And if something is essential, it's the master regulator how can it not be a human rights issue? The difference for many that are unaware then, for most viewers will probably be fully aware of the situation, but the differentiation between hemp and cannabis is often regarded as the THC content. So if you've got less than 0.2% THC, you're dealing with hemp. If you have more than 0.2% THC, you're dealing with cannabis. Your opinion on this, is this like just under education or is this just a legislative loophole that they're trying to incorporate to remove what sorry as well one of the things as well i think quite interesting as well that i actually almost stumbled across in the past few months is that the reason why often a lot of uh, hemp production through cbd companies that are arriving in the uk is outsourced is because of the basis of uh, you're only allowed to produce hemp stems and uh, leaves is that right i think no hemp stems and seeds whereas the leaves and the flowers and it have to be disregarded because these are regarded as a, as a controlled substance. Yes. Um, the legislation is, I mean, it's quite ex extremely complex. I don't know loads about the hemp legislation, as they call it. Um, under um, UK and some of EU, it's 0.2% THC um, counts as industrial hemp. Mm. And if the THC content is more than 0.2% or it's 03 internationally, um, so on an international legislation, it's 0.3% THC. Uh, after that, it's then called cannabis. But if you are a business now, and this is where it comes down to, it doesn't matter what anyone calls it. They call it what they want because the, 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 the establishment has brainwashed the public to go, ah, cannabis, but yeah. hemp's okay. So on a socially acceptable level, hemp is palatable, cannabis is not. But if you were wealthy and privileged enough, to be able to go and purchase um, a, a cultivation license, mm -hmm. you have one of two options. Sorry, one of two options. One, one is a, a low THC cannabis cultivation license, and one is a high THC cannabis cultivation license. The word hemp does not exist in licensing. Mm -hmm. You don't get a hemp license, you get a low THC cannabis cultivation license. Um, interestingly enough, I haven't got the link to the research with it, but um, when they sow a field of hemp, um, 
the seeds are clone, sown in very close proximity. So let's say in like a meter square, you may even have 100 seeds. Um, I don't know that for a fact. I'm just guessing on the figures. Yeah. But in that meter square, you have a lot of seeds, a lot of concentration of seeds to grow lots of tall plants because they grow tall seeking for the light. And that gives lots of fibrous stalk for the construction materials. So that's why uh, low THC cannabis hemp is planted in, in quite high concentration. Whereas if you were planting um, high THC cannabis, you might have one meter square for each plant. Mm. So each plant has got adequate room to stretch and to grow and to get its flowers. Um, you're not really after a lot of stalk, you want your flowers. So what I've heard is that if you take these low THC hemp seed flowers, seeds, and sow them in different environments where you're not making them fight for light in these compact situations, where if you gave each seed a meter square, and if you let it um, be pollinated to produce more seed and those seeds to generate and to grow in the same environment, the THC level will return to a higher level because this low THC level has been artificially created through special breeding, basically, to try and breed THC out of cannabis so that they can have like a THC-free cannabis. Um, as to why they don't like THC, uh, my belief is because it opens and activates the mind, whereas alcohol deadens the brain. They don't want the masses with elevated consciousness, critically thinking and questioning what they're doing. They want some subservient people going to work, coming home, dead in their brains on drink, going to work, coming home, dead in their brains on drink and not asking any questions. That's what they want because that's easy to manage. Whereas if you've got a host populace that are questioning and thinking and wondering, they can't control that. And that's why I believe we've got this uh, unjustified demonization of THC. And before we move, I'll just take you to Dronabinol. Uh, I don't know if you've you heard of Dronabinol. Yeah, and Avalone as well, yeah. Yeah, oh, so that's uh, synthetic THC. That's right. So that is a um, uh, man-made, contrived THC. Mm -hmm. um, so they can patent it, incidentally. Um, you, if you Google the safety and efficacy research for Dronabinol, it's incredibly safe and um, effective as a therapeutic compound. Uh, I've got the, it's on my website somewhere, go for it. Um, so I find it interesting how we can have this man-made pharmaceutical patented THC that is suddenly safe and therapeutic, but the natural phytocannabinoid THC is for some reason dangerous and must be controlled beyond all measure that you take people's liberty from them. You take people's homes, people's jobs, people's children and put them in prison because of THC. What is going on in this so-called free, fair, democratic and tolerant society? Mm. You know, how can that even be possible still? It is. It's completely understandable why so many people refer to individuals like yourself, like myself, as very passionate. It's very difficult not to be passionate about this. It's such a. It's just such a utmost hypocrisy. And and at the basis of this situation that really starts it is it saves people's lives first off. Let's be honest. That's the beginning. It saves people's lives, and everything follows after that. Um, just just before we go then, Phil, what would you recommend to people that want to become active with We the Undersigned? Well, before we move to that, if I could explain where some of my passion comes from. Yeah, sure. Uh, at 15 years old, um, my brother was busted by the police for some resin. It was cannabis resin in them days. He didn't really have flowers around. And he was busted for a small amount of cannabis resin by the North Wales police. My brother didn't like drinking alcohol because it made him very violent. He had a very traumatic childhood and alcohol made him violent. Uh, whereas cannabis calmed his mind and didn't make him violent. So he chose cannabis as a teenager like many teenagers do like our government know for a fact teenagers choose cannabis instead of alcohol because they don't like alcohol my brother long story short after years of harassment from north wales police he wasn't an entire saint don't get me wrong so he did do other things wrong he ends up in prison for a very small amount of cannabis uh, and he ends up leaving prison a heroin addict and now my brother's dead from heroin addiction now to me Every teenager out there that is choosing cannabis instead of alcohol and getting prosecuted and having their lives destroyed by prosecution and maybe going to prison and maybe becoming heroin addicts and then dying as a result, that needs to stop so urgently. Uh, and that is where I've got this just burning rage, passion, 
I don't even care the consequence to myself anymore because how many more of my little brother, my big brothers are out there that are going to have their lives ruined like that because of this legislation, which is all based on lies, racism, and greed. Oh, I'm sorry to hear so, that. I mean, one of the well, things well, um, that, same again, I put in the book was that individuals such as your big brother are victims of this legislation. Yeah. Because it's, yeah. I, I had a conversation actually with a woman um, the other day, and she was describing a similar circumstance that. Um, her, her husband had passed because of drug use and I had to try and um, whilst extremely empathetic to anybody's tragic loss the reality is individuals that are, that, are um, that pass because of drug use are victims of poor legislation that didn't yeah. categorize drug use or substance use in a particular dynamic that made it a health yeah. issue that made it safe and um, that made it um, which as a consequence as Portugal and other of these free thinking societies that have moved it forward they've shown that when you regulate and decriminalize substance use uh, there is a dramatic decline in not only um, drug-related deaths, but crime, suicidal um, processes as a drug substance, all these different other things that are consequential to proper legislation. I feel exactly the same. The, the legislation causes more harm than it prevents. It may well have started with good intent. That may well have been the original purpose. And I do think a lot of it is unanticipated and unintended collateral damage. Yeah. Uh, and I do think it has become corrupted by lobby groups, paying governments and politicians to keep it this way. But ultimately, in my mind, a government's job should not be to dictate to people what state of consciences they are permitted to experience. So at the moment, if you wish to alter your state of consciousness, the only way you're legally and lawfully allowed to do it is with alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, that is the only way you can recreate yourself recreationally to unwind and de-stress which is all a health choice, incidentally, or to celebrate, mourn the exigencies of daily life, you're only allowed to use alcohol. Whereas the government's job shouldn't be to dictate that. The government's job should be to make sure whatever is available to consumers is as safe as possible. And there is as much information to protect the consumers as well. So the simple fact is humans have been taking mind-altering drugs for as long as there have been humans and mind-altering drugs. We like to alter our states of consciousness to cope with life. The government, their role and responsibility should be to make sure every, every drug, every consumable substance is produced and regulated and sold in a controlled setting. That is their ultimate responsibility. And that is, to me, what they have failed on. Even Portugal, OK, they won't prosecute you. They might force you to have treatment. Mm. But if you want to be an alcoholic, you can be an alcoholic. Yeah. It, it, you've got this dual system where alcohol isn't thought of as a drug and you can use alcohol and it's not a drug, but anything else is a drug. We need to get rid of this um, moralistic hypocrisy. Mm. Why is it okay to get drunk? Why is it not okay to get high? It's funny that, because that's what, I mean, sure you hear on a daily basis, like, oh, I don't ever touch drugs, but I smoke cigarettes and I drink alcohol. It's this, this the yeah, yeah. circumstance you're like, can you even believe what you're saying? It comes down to language again, this control. It comes down, yeah, language control. The government have controlled the language, which have controlled the minds. Yeah. Uh, I did find a piece of research, I think it's about uh, 70, I, I lost it, and it actually showed where they took, it used to be alcohol, drugs, and stupefiers was the category, and then they took alcohol and tobacco out of it, and just left the drugs and stupefiers by themselves. And that was, that was the actual point in history where the, the establishment at the time took those two drugs out. And the reason was, um, a chap from America, I can't remember his name, he was like very uh, born-again Christian, very um, Puritan is the word. Um, yeah, very Puritan, and came over to the UK and said, all these drugs are bad, no one should be doing drugs, and we should have a clear mind. And everyone said, oh, okay, we can live with that, but you're not stopping alcohol, and you're not stopping tobacco because they were the main drugs of the time. They were the drugs of the establishment. And they didn't care about the one everyone else used because they weren't really used. And ironically, since they prohibited drugs, it's increased the usage. It's had the opposite effect. It's increased harms. It's increased damage. And the only way, it's the same as Al Capone and alcohol. Yeah. Until they realize the only way to reduce harms, protect the vulnerable, and respect human rights, is to make shops and off licenses and bars and restaurants and clubs for whatever substances are available and to let people do what they want to do where they want to do it and protect them that way rather than saying do this and it's morally wrong and we're going to put you in prison because it just 
No, I completely agree. It's funny that because just before we uh, finish up, the, the prohibition has never worked, and I'm not any way ideologically connected to a religion in any way, shape, or form. But it's quite interesting that even in the Bible, they've got Adam and Eve, and it's don't eat the apple, and both of them have got their teeth sunk straight into the apple. Exactly. You know, it's you tell like a child not to do something; it wants to do it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And interestingly, in the countries where they've changed the law, um, adolescent use of cannabis has gone down. Because yeah. it's no longer fashionable, because it's no longer illegal to do it. They want to do it because it's illegal. Yeah. Um, you asked what can people do to become more active? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, I mean, activism. What is activism? It's a, it's a broad spectrum in my mind. Um, sitting on the bus or in the post office queue and telling someone the truth about cannabis and the corruption. Uh, that, to me, is one of the purest forms of activism. You know, if you're on your school run, for example, on your daily circles you know your uh, rhythms of life and if you reveal yourself and your truth in those circles and try and change those minds at ground level that to me is one of the most riskiest things you can do because you might lose your entire friends and social circle but then if you lose them fair enough you can find better people that's what happened to me um after that you know there's writing to mps but that to me i think is the biggest waste of time ever those politicians aren't there for us they there they pretend to be there for us but they're not uh, i'm not saying all of them you might get the odd one maybe that still seems to work for their constituent but they don't really not wholeheartedly and mm -hmm. um, they only fight half of the fight that suits medical for example suits their image um the best thing i think is to uh, get in the group on Facebook, come onto our website, undersign wtuhq.org. Um, it had the W's before that. Um, and, and share and raise awareness. We need to make as many of those 5 million cannabis consumers in the UK aware of what's going on. Because, like me as a teacher, most are too scared to come out of the can of closet, yeah. They're too scared to reveal their identity as a cannabis consumer for the fear of the legal repercussions. Um, lose their children, lose their home, lose their job. Yeah, that's what I hear all the time. When you've had three or four near death experiences, you become less scared of all that, see? It yeah. takes all that off. But until you've been there, you're still controlled by fear. And so much of our country, anyone who chooses cannabis or would choose it, but won't because of the law, you're all being shackled by fear in your mind as well to stop you taking this substance that you've been made to believe is a really dangerous thing that will make you go mad when in fact it's quite the opposite. Um, and that to me is this, this fraud, conspiracy and terrorism. People are terrified in their homes. Lots of politicians have been involved and it's definitely not the truth. Um, what can I say? Join our campaign. Donate to the legal fund and let's take these bastards to the cleaners. Excellent. Thank you very much, Phil, for chatting to me. This has been brilliant. Thank you, Connor. Any time. Thanks to Phil for giving me his time. And thanks to you for sticking around until the end of the video. I sincerely hope you enjoy the content. I'll see you next time.